everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the fields of green and gold, and whether the grains industry has gone from the famine of drought last year to a feast this season. And on the panel, we have Cheryl Kalish Gordon, Senior Grains and Oil Seeds Analyst at Rabobank, Robert Spurway, Managing Director and CEO of Grain Corp, and John Minogue, who's a broadacre farmer and chair of the GRDC's Northern Region Panel. I also welcome representatives of Grain Growers, our corporate member of the month, to today's webinar. Today, among other things, we want to know how the season's going in New South Wales. Years of drought devastated winter crops in the recent past, but there was promising seasonal break this year and fairly regular rain since then in some parts. And if we're looking at a good harvest, what's that going to mean for prices both here and internationally? There's been some unusual demand with supermarket shelves stripped bare at one stage as everyone went into an ISO baking frenzy. But globally, our growers have some strong competition and trade tensions have placed pressure on some of our traditional markets. We'll start with Cheryl, one of the many commodity analysts that Rabobank has around the world. What's your view on how things are shaping up in New South Wales for both the harvest and prices? All right, I'll just be sharing my screen, everyone. I've got a few slides to um, share. This graphic comes from our um, uh, late May report on expectations for what was going to be planted around the country. And, uh, you know, it's a field of green, as you can see, across the country with those increases that we note here that combined to provide a, you know, to, to uh, our forecast of a 26% year on year increase in hectares being really driven by massive increases across the East Coast, most notably New South Wales, where we uh, expect that it's a 95% year on year increase. So, um, you know, that's not really um, about talking about how a massive expansion um, in and of itself, just a recovery from the years that we've had um, over the last couple. We have seen some late July, early August rain has got most people back um, in the uh, running for a good season. And certainly that is the case um, in New South Wales, where we didn't really get the dry June and early July period that um, some other parts of the country did. So um, if we uh, think about then what that means in terms of the tonnes in the bin this year, for wheat, we're looking at an East Coast harvest of about 14 million tonnes. And that's uh, mostly from New South Wales with, with a recovery to about 9.3 million tonnes. Um, and that's really about where the market's at in thinking about what um, level of production we're going to have across Australia with a, a national total in the order of about 26 million tonnes. And um, in, compared to the um, five-year average, that's a big increase um, for the East Coast, as you can see by the blue bar over to the right on the East Coast, um, and um, certainly a, a, a doubling and more of the production on the East Coast compared to 2019-20. Uh, so absolutely, if we're talking about um, feasts and famines, this is pointing to the direction of a feast on the East Coast. If we pull it all together in terms of the crops, um, the, the big three crops, so wheat, barley and canola production, um, we are looking at nearly 40 million tonnes nationally and uh, something around 12 million tonnes for New South Wales and close to 20 uh, million tonnes for the East Coast. Um, add in some oats and uh, some pulses and we'll easily tip that 20 million tonnes on the East Coast this year in our perspective at, at this point. Um, again, we're coming in above the five average nationally um, and um, also above last year quite considerably across the board except for Victoria which um, as we know was um, a big help in keeping us um, with some grain um, in production last year as well as South Australia. Um, but is this the feast that we saw in 2016-17? I think that's the question that lots of people are concerned about at this point. And um, these green bars show um, production in 2016-17. And on a national basis, you can see that we're really um, not in a situation where we're going to come in um, at the 2016-17 feast. New South Wales, however, we're much closer to um, that um, possibility. And, uh, you know, with some further upside and a really nice soft um, harvest uh, period, um, sorry, a finishing growing period and then a good harvest period, you know, that we, we might move closer to that 2016-7 uh, figure. 
Um, if we think about the pricing side of things, globally we're looking at record stocks, increased production, um, but if we take out China and India, we are in a much more balanced situation with an ending stock situation for 2021 that is in a, in a decline. Um, you put that together with what's happening in, uh, for exporters and uh, we're looking at a, a 10 million um, tonne uh, hole in the wheat balance sheet from Europe and the Northern Hemisphere is going to be looking for Australia to have um, eight or nine extra million tonnes to um, export this coming year to keep that um, trade situation um, in balance. And uh, with that all in mind, uh, and, and you know, the stock situation outside of India and China, that's why our view is that um, the wheat price has a, a fairly neutral outlook from here on in. Not necessarily from the current CBOT prices we have, which are below, you know, just sitting below um, 500 US cents as of today, but from the quarterly averages that we're trading at, we're looking at a pretty neutral um, position of 525, 520-ish uh, um, over the coming 12 months. Now, in Australian dollars, that is going to um, be assisted, we hope, um, and, and in our, is out in our forecast by some softening of the Australian dollar towards the back end of the year to about 65 US cents. The fundamentals suggest that that's um, on the cards. Uh, the fundamentals haven't been playing out for the Australian dollar in, as we'd like so far in this quite strange international market. But that would bring us into a, a, an Australian dollar equivalent on CBOT of about um, $300 or just below, you know, that 270 to 300 range over the 12 months. If we don't get the softening, 270 is closer to your number in our view. Um, here in Australia, we've been tracking since uh, two, quarter two, 2018 at well above um, five year average pricing. And of course, uh, with the uh, prospects of the, uh, the crop that we've got coming down um, and with that dollar um, expectation, we think that that um, is going to look um, something like that 330 um, dollar a ton Australian. Again, if we don't get that softening, we will be closer to a 300. And that 300 is much more like a 10 year average price. So, you know, with higher production um, and these prices, it can be a good year for Australian farmers and, and somewhat of a, a feast, if you will. Um, Wrapping it up, um, significantly increased production um, this year, but we don't think on a national basis that it's a repeat of 16, 17. We're gonna see wheat pricing lower than we have for a couple of years. We're gonna absolutely see lower barley pricing. I'm sure that'll come up in the discussion today but that I haven't covered now. Um, we have strong fundamentals for canola pricing, another thing that we might get to in the questions. Um, and so I reckon this is gonna be a really good meal. Um, for the east coast of Australia this year. Um, it won't be quite a feast perhaps um, with the high prices that people might like to prevail, but it'll absolutely feel like a feast after a multi-year drought. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. And that's the beauty of the days of the internet, that it goes well until it doesn't. So thank you for persevering. Now, don't forget to send those questions in as you think of them. Use the Q&A function and let me know if you're targeting a specific speaker with your question. Robert's up next, and in a good season, Grain Corp has a massive logistical challenge during harvest to receive, store, and then move the grain. So Robert, how are things shaping up in your view, and how have you been affected by things like COVID-19 border restrictions? Um, thanks, Karen, and it's a massive task, but it's one that we're up for, and it's one that our team are working towards, and have been for some months. I've only got one slide and there's really only three things that I wanted to talk about. If we could just go to that next slide. Um, and that is our harvest readiness. Uh, from when I started at Grain Corp in mid-March, it was apparent that things were shaping up to be a lot better than they'd been for a number of years with the rain uh, that started in February and has continued with very favourable conditions. Uh, so that harvest readiness is a key area of focus for us. Uh, the second thing I'll touch on today uh, is COVID-19. It's something that is impacting many people's lives uh, and many businesses in terms of the way we go about things. And I'll make a few final comments just on the seasonal outlook. So as we get to harvest readiness, as I said, it's a program that starts early in the year for us and it covers our full end-to-end -end supply chain. 
as Cheryl was saying, um, we believe it's going to be not just an above average crop, uh, but strongly above average. And I think the confidence we're getting of rain as recently as last weekend and the Bureau of Meteorology releasing charts yesterday indicating the conditions remain favourable through to, to harvest is exciting uh, for growers, uh, for regional communities across New South Wales and East Coast and Australia, uh, for Grain Corp and frankly for all Australians. It's going to be an important part of the recovery from COVID and the impact on the economy. Importantly, what that means is we are tracking towards an exportable surplus. That's what Grain Corp set up to do. That's where we come into our own in terms of the efficiencies and the benefits that we can pass back uh, to growers through export of East Coast grain. Just to put that in context, as many of you will be aware, whilst Australia is very self-sufficient for food, uh, there have been some areas on the East Coast where we've had to import grain from Western Australia and South Australia over the last two or three years of very severe drought. Harvest readiness, as I said, covers all ends of our supply chain. So the specific things we've been focusing on are optimising our network, getting it ready, uh, making sure it's cleaned out, but also moving plant and machinery around Australia. Typically, we base equipment in northern New South Wales and Queensland in the first instance, and then we move it south as the harvest progresses. A big part of Grain Corp and a big part of the harvest is, of course, the labour and the people that are required. Uh, we have been recruiting for up to 3,000 harvest casuals. And what's really exciting about that is in parts of New South Wales, it's the first time in three years that we've been looking to bring people in to our network to handle the harvest. Um, whilst that's going very well, we've had over 2,500 applications. And interestingly, despite COVID, we're seeing a very similar mix of the types of people that are returning uh, to our network and our business to help us out. Uh, but we are seeing some areas where there's more work to do. Areas in New South Wales like Burren Junction, uh, the Dubbo North region, so Canamble, uh, Gilgandra and, and the like, and also Dubbo West, so Ningen down to uh, Peak Hill, are uh, areas that we're looking for more people uh, right now to make sure that we're ready for the harvest. Ultimately, we want to make sure we find local people for local jobs. Uh, and that's part of responding to some of the challenges around COVID. Uh, we are conscious that despite assurances from state government, governments that casual labour and agricultural labour will be able to move across state borders, we don't want to leave that to chance. We want to make sure ultimately that we're self-sufficient in each region so we minimise the movement of people and reduce the risk not just to our business but our people and our growers as well. We do play an important role as an essential service right across our business, whether it's in the grain handling side of things, the supply chain generally, or indeed our oils processing and foods businesses. Uh, we've been doing that very well, and I'm extraordinarily proud of our team, the work we've done on COVID safe plans in New Zealand, in Australia and elsewhere, have set us up well for the harvest. It means we can prepare for, if you like, the worst case scenario, whereby there are restrictions in regional Australia through the harvest, restrictions that we'll be able to manage through having the plans in place ahead of time. Just to give you some numbers, uh, since February when the pandemic uh, kind of uh, became a feature for all of us um, in Australia and around the world, uh, we've outloaded over three and a half million tonnes from our network. Uh, we've received nearly 100,000 tonnes. And as I, as I said, our processing businesses including in Melbourne and in New Zealand, have continued to operate seamlessly. Uh, that's important, not just for our business, but for all Australian consumers that rely on the staple foods that we produce. We're also making sure that growers and others are ready to use the digital platforms that we've had in place for several years now. They'll become very important to make sure we can undertake contactless, contactless delivery of grain and the like. So our Crop uh, Connect product uh, and associated digital platforms will be important through the harvest. And by using all those things, the planning we're doing, not only are we ready to face the challenges of COVID-19, but we're ready to do that in a way that maintains safety and business continuity. Uh, just adding to Cheryl's comments on the seasonal outlook, we're very excited about the crop that's ahead. Uh, we're looking forward to the ABARES numbers that are due out again on the 8th of September 
And we certainly see upside from the numbers that they published in June based on the very favourable growing conditions we've seen in the last quarter. Uh, whilst we can't all travel a great deal at the moment, I have spent some time in southern New South Wales. I'm heading to northern New South Wales in the next couple of weeks to work with our teams. And certainly everywhere I've been looks green and the countryside looks ready for a great harvest ahead. As Cheryl said, we do expect that much of the pricing is already baked into markets around the expectation of a larger crop in Australia. And that means that Australian grain will be competitive in international markets. We're seeing good ongoing demand, which means that we're set up for that export task ahead. Um, importantly, I think we'll see the benefits of the hard work that's been done across the grain industry through these three severe years of drought. In particular, Grain Corp's delighted with the work that we've done on our network, and we're very appreciative of the work that New South Wales farmers, the New South Wales government, and others have done to set us up for a good harvest ahead. So we're looking forward to it, and we're looking forward to working with growers across the region. Thank you. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, we'll go now to inside the farm gate and have a chat to John. How are your crops shaping up in central New South Wales? And what are you hearing from the rest of the state and indeed GRDC's northern region? Look, uh, we're actually travelling pretty well here at the moment. So we run a property down in uh, central New South Wales at a place called Barm Edmund. And we're uh, in the Bland Plain. We run Merino sheep, we run Angus cattle and grow canola, wheat, barley and grow pastures. So uh, my wife and I run the operation. We have two boys and uh, Lisa's on a number of boards, including New South Wales Farmers and National Farmers. Our eldest son's in Sydney and he is undertaking a commerce law degree, just starting to finish that up. And our youngest son is at University of New England in Armidale studying rural science. So um, they're all involved in our business. The interesting thing about this picture is that's our family and the managing director is uh, our, our dog Diesel there. But this crop here is uh, my son's first crop. He's actually leased some land off me this year, my youngest son. And uh, he's wondering why this farming caper is so hard because uh, he's got a pretty handy sort of a crop growing there this year. But we're all involved in the operation and over to the right there you can see that we're actually harvesting and, and the eldest son actually commonly drives a chaser bin when he's on holidays as well. So I'm uh, a farmer, but also not just a farmer, do some other things as well. I'm involved in the Grains Research and Development Corporation. I do the uh, Northern, run the Northern Panel and uh, for New South Wales and Queensland, undertake some grower input on their investments. Um, I've actually done some work on an ASIA project on, uh, in Pakistan, uh, helping some of the farmers over there grow better pulses. I'm an executive councillor on uh, New South Wales farmers, and also my wife and I are involved in a group that actually funds our local rural financial councillor. So we have some private funding there that does that. And, uh, and then from time to time we do some things like we do up in the top right hand side there where we visit my niece who works in an Aboriginal community just south of Alice Springs and we uh, went out and gave her a bit of a hand there last year which was absolutely a bunch of laughs so that was really good fun. So I thought I'd put the season in perspective. So this is from a thing called Climate which gives us some indication as to uh, where we're sitting at from a weather perspective. And you look at last year from June 2019 through to December 2019, and this is uh, based on an, over 120 years of records. This actually tracked to be the lowest period of rainfall we've ever had in that six months. It wasn't actually the lowest amount of rainfall that we've ever had, but the reality was it uh, was due to the fact that it was probably the least amount of effective rainfall we've ever had. And the consequences of that you see on the right hand side there where we had dust storm after dust storm. Uh, we fed sheep non-stop. We had heat, we had dust, we had flies. And um, every day involved just filling the feed cart, going out feeding sheep, carting water, and then uh, watching crops that you've planted uh, die while you looked at weather predictions that effectively, and hoping that it would rain, uh, which never actually eventuated. So uh, it was quite depressing. So then, um, on the 4th of March this year, it started to rain. And uh, we started with uh, 70 mils of rain for that month. And uh, that was more rain than we'd had in the previous six months. So, so, so far this year, we've had 234 mils, which is just about over the halfway mark of the year is more rain than we've had the previous year. The farm has completely exploded. And uh, what you actually see there is um, canola crops up to your waist already looking fantastic. 
We've got uh, just taking sheep out of grazing crops of wheat that are we're battling to find the lands in. And it's created a few logistic issues around the, uh, the uh, getting on of uh, inputs and doing weed control. So we've gone from one extreme to the other, but it's a good, uh, it's a good way to have it. So we're tracking pretty well here, like we'll be well above average. We just had uh, 40 mils of rain last weekend and we're due to have another 12 mils, which is just starting on the roof of my office here now for this week. And um, look, we're pretty much uh, looking like we'll slide home pretty well to one of the best seasons that we've ever had. So um, really a huge turnaround in a very short period of time. I think that just probably five or six months ago, we were, we were up to our eyeballs still in uh, dry dams and also dust storms. So, so that's been a, a huge, huge significant change for us. Um, we've still got a few issues that we are watching very closely. Uh, there's been incidences of rust in the air, area, so uh, rust obviously can uh, attack our crop and the logistics of getting spray on could be difficult, but we'll work something out. Planes have been active in the area, putting on uh, urea, so urea has been something that we've topped up crops with. Um, there's concern, we're just keeping an eye on, uh, there's a new incursion of Russian wheat aphids, we're not really sure what the effect of those will be in a, uh, in a normal season. We're watching very closely between uh, watching Cheryl and, uh, and and all her information around grain pricing and uh, the effects that uh, COVID will have on grain markets. I'm hoping to keep Robert very busy at uh, Grain Corp and uh, have his have his staff run off their feet with my trucks running in there to deliver grain. It's going to, something that's going to be a little bit different because for three years we haven't actually had the opportunity to do too much of that. But we're uh, very excited and uh, we're all you know planning just the same as Grain Corp around some logistics. And uh, we're hoping to, to keep everyone busy and, and turn over some, some uh, cash for the season. Just thought I'd touch also on, uh, on COVID. It's probably not in the brief, but the uh, interesting thing around the community response to, to COVID, it's been interesting that uh, we've all come back as a community in these small places. We always seem very mobile and travel, but, but we've come uh, back and it's funny how many times we're now having these fire pits and, and local you can see up to the left hand side there, we've just turned a, a garage into a man cave and that's become a bit of a popular thing. But the uh, the importance of community through these droughts has been driven home and then COVID's just basically accentuated it. But, but all in all, look, we're, we're hopeful for a big season. We're hopeful that we'll end up uh, where we uh, where we should be, which is a return to, to profitability in the grain sector. And we're also hopeful that uh, we'll be able to uh, retire some debt that's been accumulating over the past three years. So. Thanks very much to the New Wales Riders and thanks to Karen for the opportunity to talk. No problem, thanks John. It's interesting, everybody thinks that a lot of rain is a good thing, but it looks like there are a few drawbacks as well. That's been a great overview of how things are going around the state and further afield. So let's dig into some of the details. Keep those questions coming using the Q&A function within Zoom. Robert, one for you that's been submitted by the Land newspaper. You mentioned local people for local jobs from a Grain Corp perspective, but what about the wider industry? How will Queensland's harsh border closure affect the harvest? Are there enough contractors and labour more generally in the right place to get the job done and on time? Look, we're confident that the industry will face up to that challenge and there will be the availability of labour and equipment one of the things that we've been pleasantly surprised at is despite the border closure and restrictions, freight and equipment um, and essential workers have moved uh, without interruption. So that gives us some confidence uh, that that will continue through the harvest. As I said, we are doing our best to make sure that we've got people in the areas where we need them uh, so that if there are tighter restrictions or challenges, it won't affect our ability to complete the harvest. Uh, and indeed, we're working with local communities on that. One of the questions we've often been asked is, what does the casual labour pool look like? And has that changed as a result of COVID? And whilst there's been changes, I've described them as being around the edges. We're still seeing a lot of returning casuals, which is good for our business because they've already been trained and they'll help train the new people that come in. Whilst there's a reduction in people on... 417 working visas. There's still a number of those people in Australia and they're desperately looking for work. So it's great to be able to help out uh, that portion and very important uh, portion of the population in regional Australia. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, whilst people may not be able to roam as far as they have in previous years, there's still people travelling around the country looking for the sort of work that we, we can offer. Um, so, as I said, although there's been slight changes, the general groupings of casuals that we've seen apply in previous years are coming through in the numbers that we've seen apply this year already. So we're confident about it. Uh, it won't be without its challenges, but I think the great thing is by planning early, uh, we can identify those challenges and deal with them before we're in the middle of harvest. That's fair enough. John, what about you? Have you had enough people around to do spraying? Are you pretty confident about harvest and things like that? Yeah, look, uh, it's an ongoing industry issue. And uh, my son at university at Armidale, uh, I think he ne he's nearly getting two, um, tw twice a week there's people advertising for labour in the northern regions. So I think as Robert alluded to, some of those north and western east, uh, regions have still got opportunities. Um, for us personally, we've got our labour sorted, but uh, and I think we're reasonably close to a couple of population centres, but there's some great opportunities for anyone who wants to go out and and uh, work in the rural community because there's uh, there's a there's a you know no, normally rely heavily on backpackers and uh, they are going to be hard to find this year and um, I think that um, if anyone wants the the rural experience, uh, get in contact with someone in the rural areas and like the Robert Spurways uh, organisations who will have some logistical stuff and also grain growers because they're looking for staff. But uh, so far we're we're not too bad. Yeah, so just generally from any of you, do you think that, that that is the case, that there are people perhaps from the cities who are losing their jobs as baristas or whatever hospitality or other areas that are moving to the, the country for this sort of stuff? It's certainly our experience that we're hearing anecdotally um, adult children or children in their late teens are returning from full-time study uh, back out to rural communities. Uh, we've even had people that work for us in the corporate environment looking to move um, out to regional Australia, given the challenges uh, of the pandemic over the last few months. Uh, so that's playing out to some extent in the um, labour applicants that we're, we're seeing in terms of casual jobs. Um, but as John said, uh, there's certainly still availability and opportunities. So uh, good to see that the regional economy is so strong with, with recent rain. Uh, we'll be able to employ many of those people. Okay. Now, another question from the land. We've come off the back of drought, so most people have been happy to see the rain, but their question is, could too much rain be affecting quality? So, Cheryl or Robert, are you hearing much about quality and whether the lack of frost has helped and things like that are being affected? I think probably it's a better, better question for John uh, to, uh, to ask, but I must say that nearly every grower I see around the country has got a pretty large smile on their face uh, and conditions are, are pretty good, if not as good as they've ever been. Uh, so whilst crops tend to be a little bit earlier than they have been, uh, there's been some reports, as John said, of, of uh, some disease, but the overall condition of the crop, uh, not just is it a large crop, but it seems to be in pretty good condition from what we're hearing. Yeah, strongly agree there with Robert that, um, uh, you know, very early days there's been some uh, crops that have been quite advanced and uh, obviously there'll be frost risk with those, but um, I think that at the moment they all seem okay. Um, I think that uh, as far as other quality issues, uh, as far as protein goes, people have been following the season and um, they've been emptying their checkbooks to throw as much uh, urea on it, on their crops as they can afford to, to try and maintain the protein levels. And then I think that our biggest issue will be if the um, seasonal forecast that they're alluding to of a wet spring, our main concern is if that then carries over into a wet harvest. So. Um, you know, unknown as to whether that will happen. We'll deal with it when it does, but uh, that would be probably the main quality issues because at the moment, like Robert's saying, what we're actually seeing is probably the crop in as good a condition as we've ever seen and growers working really hard to maintain the quality and the, uh, you know, disease-free status and insect-free status of their crops. Fair enough. Cheryl, did you have something to add on that? Yeah, look, I just think that um, all of those um, factors that 
a moister, softer finish typically would favour, you know, lower protein, um, softer wheats. And, and I think given the crop size we're looking at, um, it won't be the volumes of AH and APH that we need to worry about, but the um, relative composition of the crop would be skewed towards, um, you know, mid-protein to lower protein wheats just on the basis of that. And, uh, you know, then we get into that concern that John's just brought up about um, a wet harvest, the potential for downgrades in what is already going to be a very overburdened feed grain market due to barley um, being readily available with nowhere to go, so to speak, um, without China. Um, that is going to be a challenge if, if that happens with the wet harvest. Yeah. Now, that's another question that I'm sure everybody's uh, interested in. There was a lot of publicity about China's tariff on barley. So how did that affect growers? Did they stay away in large numbers or did they, they plant it anyway? Probably uh, from my perspective, I think that uh, there's a couple of factors at play here. Number one is that uh, the intent of China was was uh, was flagged before our planting. So there was a lot of uh, change in intention. The early rain meant that people had greater confidence to plant crops like legumes and canola. And I think uh, that meant that uh, a strongly cereal based, which is still a very high cereally based uh, plant, has actually switched a little bit to some of the high value crops with greater confidence. The other thing at play here is that I believe that uh, a lot of the barley is kept on farm. Most of my barley generally doesn't see the market uh, because it's kept on for a drought reserve and there's huge holes of, of uh, grain that people wish to replenish drought reserves to give them confidence to continue to run their livestock. The other one which I'll defer to Cheryl is that there is a mantra in the industry that just because China's not buying it doesn't mean that the net demand is still not there. So if China actually doesn't buy off Australia, they potentially buy off the Ukraine in which the Ukraine would normally supply the Middle East, in which case we'll supply the Middle East. So I'll throw that to Cheryl to see what her thoughts are. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's going to be some movement um, in, in destinations, absolutely, to move this, this grain uh, or our barley this year. You know, the first cab off the rank is, you know, in considerations is to move to the Middle East. But, um, you know, whilst it's, it's such a large importer of, of barley, it's not as big as it used to be. They are more price conscious and they are taking more um, corn than they ever have before. Um, and, and so the market isn't quite as ripe for as much barley as we might have thought historically. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, I don't think that we can't find homes for um, Australian barley. But I agree definitely with John that um, there will be an increased volume held on farm because, you know, that livestock market, it's a bit jittery at the moment, but the, the midterm view on the value of livestock in Australia is strong. And um, we do have more farmers and um, especially across the East Coast, with more on-farm storage than they ever have before. So that capacity to hold. So in my view, um, it'll be the pressure of um, cash flow that guides how much is held on farm. There will be a lot of farmers that haven't had a crop for a number of years. They will be have forced to have harvest sales and that'll absolutely put pressure. And I'm not suggesting, I'm not trying to argue that um, barley prices will be great, but I think you're not going to find those 16, 17 pricing levels because of... Um, hopefully that uh, correction in the Australian dollar, but also that capacity to hold more on farm here. And traders will be finding um, uh, markets for Australian grain in a feed grain sense, um, just as long as we're competitive. Fair enough. Now, uh, there's think, a lot of questions. Sorry, Robert, was, was that I was you? just going to add, add to that, building on what both John and Cheryl have said, uh, roughly uh, only 12% of East Coast uh, barley ends up getting uh, exported anyway. So it's, it's a much bigger issue uh, nationally from a WA production point of view. Um, and there is um, strong demand for uh, feed barley, as everyone said, on the East Coast. I think also there's many factors come into the decisions growers make about what they plant. Demand is only one of them. Uh, crop rotations and conditions and growing conditions are are equally important. So um, we've been working very hard uh, with the Australian government as well to make sure other markets are opened up. John spoke about the Middle East, uh, but there's also markets across Indonesia and other parts of Asia, which we think will become increasingly important. So as Cheryl said, there'll be some movement, but uh, we think in the longer term, the demand will remain. Yep, fair enough. Now, Robert, while you're there, uh, question from Oscar Pierce. 
how will logistics and freight differentials be influenced by the inland rail developments over the next 12 months? And given border restrictions, will road tasks be modified because of COVID-19? Again, through the harvest and beyond, there's uh, not huge amounts of, of disruption to movement of freight across borders. Um, that's in fact been totally seamless at this point in time. Um, I think on the inland rail, uh, Grain Corp's a big supporter of rail generally. Uh, it helps us uh, move efficiently. It helps Australia uh, move grain efficiently from the growing regions uh, through our network, through our ports and ultimately ensuring that we can get the best possible prices uh, in global markets. And, and the, um, the inland rail will only uh, look to boost that. Uh, there are some logistical challenges around uh, the closure of lines while that infrastructure is built. Uh, and of course, there's the aspects in certainly parts of northern New South Wales about the exact uh, routing of the rail and where it will be and, uh, and making sure that's right. So uh, from Grain Corp's point of view, we're looking forward to the completion of that project. We're looking forward to working with a wide range of industry groups and growers to make sure it's done as seamlessly as possible. Okay, and John, a question from you about, for you from Peter Morrison about thoughts on state border crossing restrictions and access to harvesting capacity. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it's something that uh, is being bandied around the industry at the moment. Um, one of the things is that, uh, you know, bad for Queensland and, um, and northern New South Wales. The season is not as great in, in Queensland. And I'd say if you drew a line from the, you know, between Moree and Gundawindi heading north, the season's not going to be a bin buster up there. They're having, you know, some seasonal difficulties. So perhaps going north, the, uh, the issue about the harvesters getting across is not going to be as bad as it could be. Um, going south could be a problem because a lot of uh, uh, grain harvesters, you know, will start in the north and move down through the, through the state of New South Wales and Victoria. Um, and, and I think there's going to be some concerns. I was just talking to a stock and station agent today who said that um, he had actually had a fellow gone into Victoria yesterday to a cattle sale and then it took him four hours to get out because they wanted him to go via Sydney, uh, drive, uh, drive back to Melbourne, go down a plane to Sydney, quarantine for 14 days before he went back to his, uh, his place of work. So, so, look, there's some issues that need to be sorted out and I think that um, hopefully the, the common sense will prevail. The uh, risk, obviously, in regional Australia is so much lower, and we do largely work in isolation. The interesting thing is that uh, when the COVID restrictions came in here locally, we were that flat out uh, planting crops. We didn't even uh, notice any difference. So I think a lot of people were saying we don't have that interaction that some of the people do in some of the other places. But yeah, it needs to be something that needs to be addressed uh, to ensure that there's uh, capacity on uh, all sides of the border, because that's generally how it's done. Mm. Yeah, no, fair enough. Another question to Robert. Uh, there hasn't been a big harvest for a few years. So with the big volumes of grain now looking likely, what silo capacity is Grain Corp going to be opened up? And what's being planned around Weybridge turnaround capacity to reduce the downtime for trucks? Um, sure, um, very good question. And where we've started on our harvest readiness is looking back to the most recent bumper harvest of 1617 and learning from that, looking at where the constraints were and putting in place measures to address them. Uh, so in many cases, we've duplicated um, uh, the Weybridge capacity and the sample stands at our sites. Uh, we know that's important because when I've spoken to growers, uh, they confirm that there's three things they look for from Grain Corp a quick turnaround at harvest. So that efficiency needs to be really, really set up and, and that's where we, we have been focused. Uh, they also look for transparency um, around the information and Crop Connect provides that in terms of our digital solutions. Uh, and of course, we also have very good payment terms. We pay growers within two days, uh, two working days of receiving the grain. Um, so all those things point towards efficiency that we have um, through the harvest. Um, I think, uh, you know, the other thing in terms of that, um, one of the, the upsides of COVID is as we look to move towards more contactless opportunities, it improves the efficiency to move trucks through our facilities uh, in at that period of time. We have over 140 facilities across the east coast of Australia. Uh, we've got another uh, 10 or 12 what we call flex sites that we can bring on 
at very short notice if we need them. And uh, really what I'd say is the hard work across our team over the last three years uh, is really likely to come into its own and be demonstrated uh, in this year that uh, frankly the whole industry deserves uh, with you know, hopefully uh, well above average crop conditions. Great. There seem to be a few silver linings out of COVID and learning to go contactless is one of them. That's right. Yeah. Cheryl, look, we've been talking about this season quite a bit. What about the longer term outlook for wheat, barley and canola when it comes to world demand? That's another question from the land. Yeah, look, we, we have to look ahead to next year. And, and when we do, we, we incorporate a recessionary um, impact. And, uh, you know, the extent of that um, is, is multi-year um, and, and recovery periods are going to be long. We're not going to see the demand growth um, that has been quite small in grains for a number of years. And, and in the case of um, biofuel feed stocks has been, um, you know, declining in a growth sense um, for a number of years already. Now, this year, as a result of COVID, we've seen that dramatically decline as people have stopped traveling the the uh, demand for ethanol has really fallen through the floor recovered somewhat but still we've got growing stocks as a result of that um, and, and so that um, you know that those coarse grain side of things has already been affected malting grains have already been affected and we expect they'll still be affected into um, the next year or so but also alongside that then you'll get um, some um, downside on feed grains as people um, you know, substitute to, um, you know, less meat in their diet across Southeast Asia. And perhaps even um, this season, we're going to see less demand for um, higher protein wheat across Southeast Asia for the likes of high protein breads and cakes and more of the mid pro, um, which can favour Australia, of course, um, in um, the, you know, the production of noodles and flatbreads and cheaper, um, you know, lower um, cost point biscuits. So we're going to see some changes. We are going to see some drag on growth. We're already in a low um, growth um, environment. And um, whilst productivity internationally continues to streak ahead of growth anyway, it's going to be a bit of a continuation of um, uh, pressure on pricing. All right, terrific. We have time for just one more question. Uh, John, it may be a little bit of a sobering finish up, but it's been pretty horrific over recent years with drought, bushfires, now COVID-19. You talked about the importance of fire pits and social outings and that you're involved in rural financial counselling. What's your feeling from that perspective of what's having the most impact and how people are doing? Uh, look, I think that we have been through a pretty tough time in the rural communities, but uh, one of the things that is the best things for uh, farmers is for them to be busy. And uh, they've been absolutely flat out of late. Uh, I must admit there've been some quite good opportunities and coping mechanisms when things were bad. And I know uh, my wife and I, you know, had had noticed that there was a bit of a deterioration in, in some of our local communities. So, so we sort of even in our own in our own lives, uh, entertained the book. We were we exercised, so we walked down to the front gate every morning for three, you know, three kilometres down, three kilometres back, and and discuss the things of the day there, and then. Uh, maintain social contacts, you know, we're encouraging people and people you haven't heard from, we've all been supporting them and, and ringing them up and making sure they're okay. You know, the importance of diet and exercise has been important and also the moderation of substances. So uh, that's been something very important as well. But, but I think what you find at the moment is uh, when um, growers and, and, and farmers are, are so much better when they can look forwards towards something. and. Um, Sitting there watching a crop die is as depressing as you could ever get and just walking up every day to feed the same sheep in the same paddock and tapping the silo to see whether you've got enough grain to feed them again next week um, is extremely depressing. But I mean, we all support each other as well. And uh, now with the prospect of some income, there's great excitement. And I think people being busy has been a help as well. Terrific. Well, yes, hopefully that everything continues on the, the up and up. That's all we have time for today, unfortunately. It's been a great discussion and thanks for all the questions flowing in. I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours. A virtual round of applause for our panel for giving up their time today. Cheryl Kalish Gordon from Rabobank, Robert Spurway from Grain Corp and mixed farmer John Minogue. Thanks to you for joining us for today's webinar. Have a great weekend and stay safe.